Hello. This is the third of three videos providing an introduction to the federal sentencing guidelines. Part one provided an overview of the United States Sentencing Commission. Part two provided an overview of the federal sentencing guidelines and described the three-step approach and the basic approach of the federal sentencing guideline system. In this video, you will learn about the basic structure of the federal sentencing guidelines and the initial application decisions that must be made for correct application for federal criminal defendants. As mentioned in part two of the introduction to the federal sentencing guidelines series, the ultimate result of application of the federal sentencing guidelines is the determination of a sentencing range for an individual defendant. The sentencing table, as you can see on this graphic, plays a critical role in the sentencing of federal criminal defendants. The intersection of a particular point on the vertical axis, which provides a numeric proxy for the severity of the defendant's conduct in the instant offense, with a particular point on the horizontal axis, which provides a criminal history category based upon the severity of the defendant's prior criminal offenses, will provide the court with the applicable guideline range for a particular defendant. So, how does the court arrive at the sentencing range for a particular defendant? Well, that process is specifically outlined in the U.S. Sentencing Commission's Guidelines Manual. Let's review the Guidelines Manual itself. The manual is divided into eight chapters. Chapters one through six are the chapters that are relevant for the determination of the guideline range for a particular offender. Chapter one of the manual outlines the instructions, definitions, and application principles to be used in the application of the federal sentencing guidelines. Chapter two provides the numerous offense guidelines for the many varied federal criminal offenses. The chapter two guideline is based upon the federal offense of conviction and provides the basis for determining the offense level on the vertical axis of the sentencing table. Chapter three of the manual provides additional adjustments to the offense level based upon the defendant's conduct associated with the instant federal offense. Chapter four of the manual is the basis for the horizontal axis of the sentencing table. This chapter provides instruction on the determination of the defendant's criminal history category. Chapter five of the manual provides instruction to the court on the determination of the guideline range, including consideration of statutory penalties, as well as factors that may cause the judge to sentence outside of the otherwise applicable guideline range. Chapter six provides information on sentencing procedures and pleas. Chapter seven and eight are not used in the initial calculation of a defendant's guideline range for the instant federal offense. Chapter seven provides guidance to the court in the determination of penalties for violations of supervised uh, release and probation. Chapter eight addresses the sentencing of organizations rather than the sentencing of individual defendants. In sum, chapters one through six of the guideline manual provide the necessary information the court will use to determine an appropriate sentencing range for a federal criminal defendant. It is also important for you to understand the structure of a guideline. Each guideline in the manual, regardless of the chapter in which it's located, is cited in a particular way and contains specific parts. Let's review the guideline structure now. As you can see on this graphic, this is the proper citation for a guideline. This guideline is section 2B 3.1, which happens to be the guideline for robbery. The first number refers to the chapter in which it's located. The letter refers to the part of the chapter in which this guideline is located. The next number, in this case, three, refers to the subpart of the chapter in which the guideline is located. And the final number, located after the point, is the guideline. This citation, therefore, refers to the first guideline in Chapter 2, Part B, Subpart 3. Each guideline in the manual and each chapter contains specific sections. We just took a look at the citation for an individual guideline. At the beginning of various chapters, as well as parts of chapters in the guidelines manual, you will also find introductory commentary that describes the purpose of the chapter or part and may also describe the theory behind the application of that particular section. 
each Chapter 2 guideline has a specific structure and each part is extremely important in the calculation of the appropriate offense level for a defendant. Each Chapter 2 guideline has a base offense level. A base offense level is the starting foundation for guideline application. It provides a specific number of offense levels attributed to a particular offense. For example, the base offense level for robbery is 20. Specific offense characteristics are additional factors provided in each guideline that provide increases, or in some cases, decreases, to that initial base offense level. Cross-references may direct the court to apply another guideline section if a particular factor is present in the defendant's conduct in the instant offense of conviction. Special instructions are just what they sound like, special instructions guiding the court on application of a particular guideline. Chapter 2 guidelines always include a base offense level. The overwhelming majority of Chapter 2 guidelines include specific offense characteristics. Some guidelines include cross-references, and very few include special instructions. All Chapter 2 guidelines also include a section entitled Commentary. Commentary provides additional important instructions and information on the application of a particular Chapter 2 guideline. Included in this commentary are statutory provisions, which is a list of the statute for which the guideline is commonly applied. Application notes are crucial. These paragraphs provide definitions, application instructions, and sometimes departure factors that the court need to consider in application of the guideline and the sentencing of a particular defendant. The background provides information on the factors considered in the creation of a particular guideline. And finally, the historical notes provide a list of amendments and the year in which the amendments were made to that particular guideline. The historical notes function as a legislative history of a particular Chapter 2 guideline. Now that you are familiar with the structure of the manual and the guidelines within the manual, let's move on to discussing initial application decisions. It is important to remember that the guidelines manual is applied in order starting with Chapter 1 and moving through the remaining chapters. The first decision to be made is which book to use. The guidelines are amended each year. There is a guidelines manual for each year beginning in 1987. The basic rule is found at 1B1.11 and is use the manual in effect at the time of sentencing. However, if use of the manual in effect at the time of sentencing presents an ex post facto issue, the guidelines manual in effect at the time the offense was committed is to be used. Once the court determines the appropriate guideline manual, the next step is to determine the appropriate Chapter 2 guideline for the defendant's instant offense of conviction. Guideline 1B1.2a states that the Chapter 2 guideline applicable to the offense of conviction determines the appropriate Chapter 2 offense guideline. To assist the court in this determination, the manual provides a statutory index found in Appendix A of the Guidelines Manual, the Statutory Index. This graphic provides an example of a listing at Appendix A. In the left column, you see a list of statutes of conviction. On the right, you see the Chapter 2 guideline corresponding to the offense of conviction. For the majority of the statutes listed, there is one guideline corresponding to a particular statute of conviction. However, as you can see, in the case of a violation of 18 U.S.C. Section 2113A, there are four guidelines that correspond to that statute. 2B1.1, the theft guideline, 2B2.1, the burglary guideline, 2B3.1, the robbery guideline, and 2B3.2, the extortion guideline. The reason that some statutes correspond to a number of guidelines is because that statute describes a range of criminal conduct. In this case, 18 U.S.C. Section 2113A describes conduct ranging from theft to extortion. How then does the court select the appropriate Chapter 2 guideline? As described in 1B1.2, the court will need to look to the offense of conviction 
That is, the count of which the defendant was specifically convicted to determine which guideline appropriately addresses the criminal conduct described in that instant offense of conviction. If the count of conviction describes theft, guideline 2B1.1 should apply. If the count of conviction, however, describes robbery, guideline 2B3.1 should be applied by the court. In some circumstances, a defendant may be convicted of an offense that is not listed in the statutory index found in Appendix A. This does not happen often, but in a case in which the statute of conviction is not listed and therefore does not have a corresponding guideline, the court is directed in 1B1.2 to look to two particular guidelines for guidance. For felony offenses of conviction, the court will look to 2X5.1. For misdemeanor convictions, the court will look to 2X5.2 for instruction. For further instruction on specific guideline application, please look at our additional videos describing single count application, chapter three adjustments, relevant conduct, and criminal history.